hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. So we have Jessica Goodman, who is uh, the main editor and translator of, the, of um, our latest title, uh, Charles Phillips of the Philosophes. So Jessica, if that's okay with you, I will start by introducing you a bit and then just um, go over with uh, both his questions and our questions. So, um, so Jessica is an Associate Professor and Tutorial Fellow in French at St. Catherine's College in Oxford. Uh, there you teach uh, early modern French literature as well as French language. Uh, if that's correct. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, today basically we will go um, uh, over some questions about the latest title um, and we wanted to ask you like how was the project, uh, what experience you had in the translation being a collaborative translation and more. Uh, so uh, if you want to briefly introduce the book to us. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a translation and an edition um, of a play called Les Philosophes. So we've called it The Philosophe. There is a reason behind that, which I will come to at some point, um, uh, by the 18th century author um, Charles Palissot. Um, it appeared in 1760. Um, so what we've got here is um, it's actually the, the French text and the English text both appear in the, in the book together. Um, and there's an introduction as well and some notes. Um, so far, so kind of reasonably standard. But um, the, the interesting thing about this text is that it's a, a collaborative translation. So it's a translation into English that I did along with um, what was at the time my second year students. Um, we did the project across a whole year um, of their of their translation classes. Um, and then the introduction itself is also sort of semi-collaborative in as much as um, it's partly translated from a, a French, uh, an existing French edition of the of the play. Partly, I've added new things into it as well. So it's a kind of a bit of a hybrid um, text in a lot of different ways. And um, the play itself is. Um, very briefly is is basically attacking um the, the the group of individuals who came to be known as the philosophes um we would most often think of people like Diderot um we tend to include Voltaire in that as well although he actually plays a bit of an interesting role um in this um in, in this particular grouping also and other people who are slightly less known like Elvis Hughes people who were involved in writing producing the encyclopedie which was the great encyclopedia that was being produced in the mid 18th century. Um, so this text is part of a big quarrel um, of a group of people who sort of termed themselves the anti-philosophes, so the people who are against the philosophes, setting themselves up against them and um, critiquing them for all manner of things. And Charles Paluzo is, is one of those, really. Well, thank you so much. That's actually, that, that sounds like a really interesting both process and, and, and book to be translated. But I wanted to ask you, like, what was the starting point? Like, where, where did all this project like, begin? So I teach on the um, master, Masters in the Enlightenment in, in Oxford, um, which is a, a sort of cross-language, semi-interdisciplinary course. Um, and one of the seminars that I was teaching a few years ago, um, I decided I was going to focus on this quarrel because we structure some, uh, our first term of seminars around kind of the idea of kind of um, enlightenment quarrels, so um, debates and quarrels and things that people were having in the period. Um, and I decided I was going to teach this text because it's a kind of an interesting entry point into thinking about how um, texts that were produced across um, quite a short period of time, so this text and a load of texts that respond to it, how they kind of create a grouping of people known as les philosophes, conversely also create the anti philosophes so how these texts are used to structure these people. So I decided I was going to teach that and then I realised at the very last minute that we had some students on the course who were in fact um, focusing on German studies and didn't speak a word of French and I got asked at the last minute to, um, to try and find some translations of the texts we were using and it turned out there were there were a couple of translations available but they were both one of them someone had done as a master's project a very long time ago another one was self-published and um, I wasn't entirely convinced that it, you know, these, these translations kind of properly grasped what was going on in the text. So I thought, you know, shelved it as a, that would be one day, that would be an interesting thing to translate. And then I decided actually, this would be a really good thing to do as part of, um, of our translation classes with, with a group of second years. So it sort of started off out of kind of necessity in a way, but it's really yeah. nice now. I've taught this same seminar again since producing the text. It was fantastic to see the students then quoting from our version of the translation. It was really exciting. I'm sure you also made life easier, like for a lot of teachers <laughs> and outside and professors dealing with the same problem. So it's, it's actually the quite right. Uh, so um, one of the things that makes this text unique is the fact that it's not translated used by you or it's used like as we've said before, in the project effort, in which his students were included as well. So, uh, why was 
that done that way? Like, why did you decide to involve these students? In, in well, the in, in part, it's to do with the structure of the of the course in Oxford. Actually, that the, the, our students don't have any exams in second year, so often their translation into English classes in second year we can use to be quite kind of experimental and do interesting things. And often I get them to translate bits of poetry and translate bits of rap and all sorts of things like that. Um, but one thing they very rarely get the chance to do, unless they take um, a specialist translation paper in their final year, is to do a kind of sustained translation. So quite often they'll translate 400, 500 words or something. And that's great from one perspective because they get a whole range of different styles. But what they never have to really do is think about the things that a kind of a real translator has to think about, which is, you know, oh, OK, this term was used here. And then, you know, 25 pages later, the same term comes up can I use the same thing in English and, you know, sustaining style and kind of all sorts of choices like that and contextualization. And so I thought actually this would be a really interesting project to do with this group of students. Um, and they were keen. <laughs> um, so we decided that rather than doing different texts every week, we would just spend an entire year um, focusing on translating this text. So um, we started off um, by spending a week or two thinking about I, I, it was it was sort of translation theory, but it was mostly kind of um, kind of broad, different ways of translating things. So, do we want to translate things exactly? You know, do we want to um, try and make it kind of more of a cultural translation so that it feels the same in to an English speaker as it does, did to the French speaker? So, we had debates like that, and already that's the kind of thing that you know you you sort of engage with in passing if you do a short translation but you then kind of put aside and actually thinking no that you know we would like the aspiration was that we would be able to publish this that there would be real readers so you all of a sudden all these questions suddenly become much more significant um and then you know we the students then had a certain amount of agency in terms of, of the approach we took so thinking about um okay so this is a play uh, it's a play that's in verse and in rhyme it's in french alexandrines what do we do with that? Do we just ignore the verse entirely or do we try and do it into some kind of free verse or you know, do we try and keep rhyme? And what they and I collectively decided was that we would translate it into iambic pentameter, um, which added a challenge, <laughs> um, but it was like, <laughs> there's a lot more fun in some ways. Um, part of the reason we did that was because I think the original is pretty cliched. Um, I mean, a lot of people are somewhat surprised when they when I say I've translated this text because they say it's not that great you know kind of from a people have a sort of low literary view of it in some ways um but uh so yeah so to kind of keep that cliched aspect we thought okay we'll make it out of pentameter we won't attempt rhyme because that might be going a step too far <laughs> um but that actually I mean, that added a challenge, as I say, it, it made the process for the students, I think, of thinking about how you translate, it made it much more interesting because it made them realise how many different ways you could translate the same thing. You know, when you've got a constraint of, OK, we have to have this number of syllables and, and this type of stress, all of a sudden you have to be more creative. Whereas if you're translating into prose, you can just say, oh, well, that's basically means the same. And you sort of stop there and you never think about the alternatives, which might actually be more appropriate even in prose. So that was yeah. good. Um, I think it also, it also, I mean, it took, it took people a while, I think, to get used to the idea of how the stresses worked. You know, quite often we'd get, a, oh, it's great, I've got the right number of syllables. And then you'd say it out loud and realise it, you know, it just didn't work <laughs> in the stress. Um, Having said that, we would get to the point, I think, where I'd be, I remember cycling home from classes um, with kind of do -do 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 going through my head that you know, everything was turning into a pentameter. So, um, but yeah, so that, you know, so the students had kind of that, that agency as well. Um, and then, yeah, we worked on it across the course of the year. Um, and we can talk a bit more about how the, how the process worked as well, if that's... Yeah, I was going to ask, like, it's really interesting to see, like, especially now that you say, like, you, you started from scratch, you needed to decide a lot of things, you needed to decide what um, translation, like, um, rules were you going to, you were going to apply for this particular text. Also, like, what, what kind of, like, changes you had to make. I think the fact that you actually translated into Yamik Fentimish, it makes it a lot of work. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, congratulations for that. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to ask you, like, um, the, how was the, the processes and, like, had the structure of having everyone, like, you know, dealing with all the different bits of the translation actually responding to the needs of each student as well I think it's mainly students and you so you will need to also like from a professor's point of view also like guide them um more specific ways sometimes so how is the whole yeah 
Yeah. Like, so obviously the first thing we had to do was decide which version we were going to translate because there are various different versions of the play. Um, and I decided on their behalf because they hadn't, didn't, you know, didn't know all of them, but um, to use an edition by Olivier Ferré, um, which appears in a really useful text which includes not just the play, but all the different things that responded to it that make up this quarrel I was talking about. And, and it's actually, that's the um, text that I use the translation of as the basis for my introduction, which I will talk about at some later stage. But um, so we chose our edition. We also read one of the translations that I mentioned that existed, yeah. um, or at least I got them to read bits of it and to sort of critique it to think about you know, how we wanted to approach our, so that was our starting point. And then in terms of how we did it from week to week, the first kind of pass through, we split the text up into bits and the students would go away and translate a chunk each, each week or each fortnight we're doing and put it onto a Google document in a shared Google Drive. Um, so we, we built up, we gradually built up the, the library of the whole thing. But instead of trying to, trying to translate the whole thing initially, what we would do is then in the class, um, they would sit in pairs looking at one of those Google documents that someone yeah. else had produced and going through it and often in the first instance not really changing anything but putting notes you know yeah. queries. I'm not sure I agree with that that doesn't have the right number of syllables um would this be a better word you know that kind of thing um so it was a really iterative process so we would do that they would be doing that in pairs sitting in my room um on their on their computers but I was able to obviously look at the documents but also listen to what they were talking about so if I heard some of them having a discussion about a particular word you know I might go and and, and suggest something else and it was it allowed me to to sort of model some of the ways that you might what I was talking about earlier on that idea of kind of you know how how are you flexible with a translation that yeah. you know different things that you can do so you might turn a verb into a noun or you might um instead of trying to translate that line then that line you might mix them up a bit and that actually makes it much easier um thinking about kind of units of sense and and so on so that was quite nice because it meant that they were kind of working independently but in those they were kind of like supervision sessions I guess you know it feels like a bit of like a peer review process within the translation process which exactly, is exactly yeah and, and I think, I mean, that's one of the key things with translation that it, it often requires somebody else to read it because the problem is that when you've read the original and produced the translation, you've still got the original in your head. And so you so often just go, well, of course that makes sense because you know, you're, you're hearing it in the original, yeah. whereas somebody else reading it who hasn't been you know, staring at the original minutely says, yeah, that doesn't sound like English at all. Or, you know, um, and so that, that was really, really helpful. So we did that across, across probably the first couple of terms, really. And then the final term, once we'd done that for the whole text, we then went through again in longer chunks. I said, you know, set them all, you read these three scenes at home, you read the, these three scenes at home and really refined it and refined it and refined it and spent more of that time um, going through stuff in class times um, and to, to kind of really deal with the knotty bits. And then they all went off on a year abroad and I did more iterations of it <laughs> and I had a maternity leave and all sorts of complications. Um, so yeah, so th th it's been, it was a very slow process, but I think coming back to it again and again, both with different people and as the same individual really helped to refine that, I think. Um, and I think what's nice then is that, is that the students, you know, it genuinely is their translation. <laughs> um, they, they've all got bits that they did, but then because I had the kind of oversight of it as well, there is a, there's a sense of sort of continuity across it that if they yeah, no, translated an act each or something you wouldn't have got so um so it's kind of it was interesting because this was all obviously pre-covid um <laughs> but but we were doing a type of collaborative working that I guess quite a lot of people got used to doing now which is you know using those shared documents and this could it could have all been done relatively easily online actually we could have been in different rooms on zoom or something happening yeah, you were ready before we even like exactly about this being the norm yeah the <laughs> yeah you also mentioned about like that the introduction you briefly mentioned it before and like how it also has a collaborative aspect so i was wondering whether you could like tell us a bit more about it yeah so i took as the basis for my introduction um and for the notes actually that appear in the text um olivier ferre's um, notes and introduction for this edition that I was talking about, which really sets the text in this kind of quarrel um, 
uh, what's the word, context. Um, but because I think I, that's one of the reasons I think this text is interesting, even though everyone says, you know, literary value, genius, you know, I think it's interesting because, because it's a sort of key into a bigger, into a bigger debate. Um, so I took that introduction, but I was also very aware that A, it was quite specific to um, setting up the context of the quarrel and, and didn't necessarily have the kind of broader context of who these people are and all that kind of thing. And, and B, that it was possibly less accessible for an Anglophone audience initially. So what I've added to the introduction is a lot more explanation of context of who people are. I've got lots and lots of footnotes explaining who, <laughs> who individuals are. Kind of linking um, the whole. Yeah, linking stuff together. And the other thing I've also done is um, put links into where choral texts are available. So where say a pamphlet that responded to the play um, is available online on Gallica or on Google Books, which you know they all are now, especially after this year, yeah. in fact. So yeah. <laughs> the really great thing about this year. Um, I've put links into those as well, so that that means that um, an Anglophone audience can quickly see, oh, okay, that this Mackie they're talking about, I understand who he is. But even a Francophone audience can very quickly access the kind of the, the network of texts um, that, that all belong together, um, which I think is, is something that's a real benefit of, of, of this kind of format. Yeah, no, definitely. It's fantastic. And I must say, as, as someone who's always looking like for the different sources that I mentioned, different texts, I must tell you, thank you so much for that, because I look forward to really happy with it. Uh, so another question I wanted to ask you is, um, so we have gone through like the idea of text, the context of text, uh, how the text is perceived nowadays as well, and the fact that it has been done as part of like a translation done in a course within trans that would which uh, yeah translated into a, a proper book and a proper translation that is now published. So I wanted to ask like who is the dissertation name? Like what is the kind of target group that you have in mind? Because it has so many aspects that are really interesting for different groups that I just wanted like know like who you had in mind when yeah I I mean I think there are things that it does that are useful for different groups of people. I think you know, the, the sort of primary fact of having a translation um, obviously makes this text accessible to an Anglophone audience who would not have been able to access it before. And I think the, as I, the, the sort of way I talked about the notes, the, you know, the, the contextual notes and the elucidations and things it sort of assist with that. And part of the reason I think this is interesting is because this whole quarrel that I keep going on about, this is possibly one of the most accessible elements of it. It's a play, we, we, you know, we, we recognise what a play looks like. Um, it's a play that is very heavily based on some Moliere plays, so plots of plays that we may or may not recognise, but certainly, you know, there's a kind of standard, uh, there are standard comic tropes in it and things. Um, and so, and it was performed at the Comédie Française, so whilst this quarrel took place in pamphlets and clandestine publications and things that were circulated in all sorts of different ways. This was the kind of the most visible public bit. So by translating it, we've given an Anglophone audience a kind of way into this much more complicated network of things, some of which haven't been translated, yeah. lots of which haven't. But um, and it also, I think, interestingly links um, to some bigger texts. This is something I talk about in the introduction, but there are some kind of, there are some links with um, uh, Le Neuve de Rameau, um, Rameau's nephew, which is another text, which is yes, translated in the open book <laughs> series actually, um, by Diderot, which is seen as a more canonical text. I mean, it's, it's still a, a, a bizarre text in its own way, yeah. but it, it's certainly a more mainstream text. Um, so it, so it's, so it's aimed at an audience who you know, might want to start making those links. But I also hope that for even for a Francophone audience, um, that ability to, to see the parallel text, but also to make those quick links to all the quarrel texts will help to kind of really grasp that, that sense of the quarrel. Um, and then I think also, I mean, this maybe isn't the actual audience of the text, but it's, it's a sort of an audience in some ways in as much as I think, I hope it can be a model for, for colleagues of mine you know, across the UK and elsewhere as well about how you can, how you can do this kind of project. So how you can bring together teaching. And I, you know, I think, and I hope and the, the students have said that they, they got a lot out of it just from in terms of how they, how they improved in their translation and things. They also got a lot out of it in the sense that they have now published a translation of a book, which is yeah, amazing. Which is great. Um, but it's also linked to my own research interests and something I've been working on for a long time. And it will provide a teaching tool for me and for other people using it for, um, for, for classes in the future. So I think there's a sort of pedagogical side to it as well. I, I hope will be interesting to other people. 
Yeah, no, definitely. And it's, it's what I said before. I have a feeling that it's a really rich resource and that you can actually take like even like the whole thing or just some bits of it and just like play around with it, not to, just the translation, but also the links that you mentioned. And it's just like, it can take you anywhere and you can learn a lot. And I mean, I don't know much about like why canons are canons, but I feel like we should definitely, people should definitely reassess it or, or redefine its position in, in, in the cultural uh, world in which it, it, it was created and it's been read and that. So. Um, so my final question would be like, why did you choose an open access publisher? Like, why did you decide to take out this project and just publish it open access instead of going to the most more traditional publishing uh, method? Yeah. Would actually it, well, in part, it's that accessibility that I've been talking about in terms of, you know, linking to things. Um, not just linking to the coral text, but also if you're reading something online and you want further information on somebody that you don't know about, actually, it's really easy to go and look at, you know, I haven't quite put the Wikipedia links in, but it's that kind of, you know, that ability to, to quickly find further information, I think is really useful with this kind of text. Um, but I also think that, um, well, open access publishing in general is, is obviously something that we should be aspiring to as much as we can. And if one of the things I'm trying to do is make this little known and rather disparaged text kind of more visible and more interesting to people then I think using an, an, an open access form is really useful and also the fact that the Nibidoramo appears in the same series I think is really nice because it um you know that has made that text which is incredibly complicated um visible to and kind of accessible to a much broader audience in part because it has all sorts of musical elements and things and yeah. you know, our text is not quite that complicated but um sort of showing that it's part of that same sort of network that these texts don't exist in a vacuum you know that they're all responding to one another and that one of the arguments I make in the introduction is precisely that um you know you you make if you define a certain group of people as the philosophe you're defining yourself as the anti-philosophe and and so it is in writing this grouping that you kind of define yourself and that yeah. you're always taking a position with respect to other texts around you um and so I think that the, I mean, the internet just does that, doesn't it? It shows you that, that, you know, that there are always links to other things. Um, and so I think that's another reason for it. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I do think that especially like you mentioned before um, that the text uh, was created as a consequence or like at least like um, moved by the fact that there were many available translations online. Uh, so I think the fact that you did it, like you, you decided to go for an open access publisher is actually really helpful to like people everywhere in the world that might find themselves in the same situation as you and just like, yeah, hey, this is an authority translation properly done with um, collaborative uh, yeah, nature. So well, we, we, we can just thank you because we're really happy to have it there. <laughs> catalog so we're very biased in that sense so but yeah uh, so I wanted to fi like finalize by, by saying like do you want to share any other remarks with uh, the audience and anyone who's watching um I mean I think it was I think that like, we, I've talked about the collaborative aspect of it but I think it was really useful and revealing for me as well actually to work with the students and I should thank them all actually that you know <laughs> make sure I make sure I name them all there's Felicity Gersh and Caitlin Gray and Nina Lidikens and Rosie Rigby and Phoebe Jackson and Lorenzo Edward Jones they were they were fantastic and and I think working with them sort of challenged some of my you know things that I would automatically have done with the text actually they maybe did something different and so that was really that was really productive um, and I think sort of showing that you can do something out of your teaching that then becomes a, a scholarly resource is really is really useful and um, the final result in print as well that always is really yeah absolutely <laughs> <fine>. great then <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and just in terms of um what you were saying as well in terms of kind of accessibility just at the end there I suppose that one of the things that the availability of older texts online is doing now is that we and I mean in, in their original forms as well is that that sense precisely of, you know, well, these are the texts we study because those are the ones that have been edited and published and, you know, translated, that's being broken down because you can very easily get hold of a whole range of different texts, you know, just by searching on the, on the, you know, the BNF catalogue or in Google Books. Um, and I think there's a danger to that in that you, you don't necessarily, you have to, you still have to assess the kind of context in which texts appeared. And um, so I hope that what we're doing here is a sort of, is sort of bringing together both that accessibility of more minor texts with that kind of contextualization that you need in order to understand um, why they might have been considered minor at the time but or why they might be considered minor now even if they weren't at the time and that, so that sort of sense yeah. of, 
um, making things accessible, but in a way in a way that provides you with a kind of scholarly apparatus for it. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. So as we've mentioned before, uh, this book is an open access site also is available to read and download by, every, by anyone um, at our website. So I will put the link on here so anyone watching just click below and you can access it. And thank you so much again, Jessica. Thank you for being with us today. It's a fantastic word, the one that you've published and, and as well that like your students have published. So thank you again from the OBP. Thank you very much. It's been a great process. Thank you. Thank you.